Okay, hi, this is Swift Sojourner, and welcome to a video that's a bit different to my usual content. Obviously, the video that I've been uh, working on recently, or the recording rather that I've been working on recently, is a recording of Armageddon 2419 AD, the very first of the Buck Rogers uh, novels, uh, published way back in 1928. 1928? Yes, 1928. Um... So what I've got for you today is something uh, related to that, but from something of a more modern uh, time period. Uh, it is, in fact, the Buck Rogers 25th century role-playing game, uh, as produced by TSR, the company who, obviously, if you have any interest in this video at all, then you probably know that TSR produced uh, the original Dungeons & Dragons and uh, later AD&D um, before they uh, sold the property to Wizards of the Coast from second edition, uh, third edition onwards. Uh, so this uh, this game is very similar to uh, AD&D in a lot of ways. Uh, this is a boxed edition. Um, obviously this is just the cover. So I've got the other stuff out for easy access. Um, it's about 25 years old at this point, and I got it second-hand anyway, so it's in pretty shit condition. Um, but it's still quite a nice thing, and I quite like the art that you always get with these old sci-fi uh, properties. Um, this guy here is obviously very reminiscent of the Gene Stilo cultists that have recently made a return in Warhammer 40k, so that's that's an interesting little uh, coincidence, shall we say. Uh, you've got Buck Rogers himself there, obviously, and these various other generic women. <laughs> uh, I have no idea whether that's intended to be the princess or indeed Wilma Deering. Neither of them look particularly like either of those characters, but that's never a, a particular guarantee with these things. So, shall we have a look and see what's actually inside the box? That sounds like a good plan, doesn't it? Uh, there are three books contained within this uh, uh, within this box. The first book is the Characters and Combat book. This is basically the equivalent of the Player's Guide. Um, you've got that really nice logo. I do like that logo, actually. Um... This is obviously based a lot more on the uh, 1980s, uh, no, 1970s, sorry, TV show uh, than it is on the book that I've been looking at. Um, so you can see the costumes are very distinctly 70s, 80s. Uh, I believe this was, this edition was published in, uh, it doesn't say on that thing, but it does on the box. Uh, it was published in 1990, um, but I believe the game was originally published in 1988 or 89, uh, and this is a later boxed edition. Um, the art is, as always, interesting. You have this very curious set of holsters that gives everyone a very, very noticeable crotch bulge, whether or not they should have them or not. Uh, and obviously her head is bent so far back that I think her neck should have snapped in half. Um, but, you know, other than that, the, the art's not too bad. Um, this one's quite interesting. It contains the details for the various uh, player characters that you can have. Um, including details on different races. Races in big inverted commas, because... As with these things, you've usually got the equivalent of species, including this guy, who is quite obviously the villain from the fifth element, uh, who is a Martian. Uh, the player characters are all just different variations of human, oh, except for this guy, who has dead blank eyes. So that's, that's an interesting one, that's a Lunarian. Uh, and Zeus from the animated Batman series, 
which is pleasing as well. Uh, what else have I got in here? Sure, I had something else bookmarked. Ah, yeah, this was it. Ah, yes, the Jennies, uh, which are the monsters for this setting uh, in a few different forms, all basically human. And it does say in the, uh, if I can get this camera to focus, uh, it does say in the later um, books where it gives you rules for creating your own jennies that they are all based on humans or on uh, earth life forms at least. Uh, jennies being short for genetically modified uh, organism or something equivalent to that. Um, so they all are theoretically only capable of doing things that other earth creatures are capable of doing. Such as making really weird thrusting poses in midair. Okay, that's quite enough of that. Um, did I have anything else? No. Well, while we're actually looking at this um, book, I suppose we might as well talk about the system itself. Uh, as I'm looking at this, uh, we may as well do a short review of the thing. As you can see from this uh, character sheet, it will look very, uh, very familiar if you've played any of the older editions of Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, the It uses the same split system that the old D&Ds used, which really annoys me because I don't like that system at all. But it uses the D20 system uh, for uh, combat, including the classic uh, Thaco. Although it does specifically say that it's pronounced Thaco, but... Uh, that's stupid, so we're not going to do that. Uh, so, yeah, the Thaco system with the D20 for combat and a skill system uh, using a D100 um, for doing anything that's not combat related. And you have all of these ridiculously specific saving throws, all of which you have to work out separate modifiers for. And for every combat encounter that you have, you have to work out which saving throws you should be using. And it all gets very tedious very quickly. So, yeah, I'm not a huge fan of this system. Um, but that said, it's got a nice variety of player characters uh, and the jobs that it gives for them. Uh, while they basically conform to the original uh, sort of D&D &D classes, you know, fighter, mage, um, rogue, cleric. Uh, there are some slightly different ones. Obviously, you have a pilot class, the Rocket Jock, uh, who is a bit more uh, piloting-oriented, funnily enough. Um, but I would imagine that's not a particularly interesting class to play, as they don't seem to be balanced towards combat or anything. So it's just a getaway driver who sits in the car otherwise. I'm reminded of the Rigger class from Shadowrun. But at least the rigger could use drones and things like that. Um, the pilot, or the rocket jock, sorry, seems to just be able to drive very well and not do very much else. So I can imagine that being quite a not fun class to play. Uh, next up we have the world book with some very suspiciously titillating art there. What do we think? Is that a deliberate thing? I mean, they've got a bit better than a lot of the art of this time in that they have the woman standing up and the man kneeling on the floor, where it's usually the other way around, but they have ruined it a bit with the I'm going to stick my ass out pose that the woman's doing. This is the world book, which is a bit more akin to the Game Master's Guide. Um... That said, it's not um, exclusively for the Game Master. There's details on the planets and things like that um, that uh, that the players would be interested in using as well. Um, and it's got designing your own jennies there so you can create your own monsters for the system. Um, and in fact, it does somewhere. Uh, yeah, it specifically encourages you to create your own rather than 
using the ones they give you, uh, stating that in any of the pre-written scenarios, uh, and I don't know offhand how many um, uh, supplements were actually published for this setting, uh, but the uh, but it says that they would have uh, all of their own material um, published with them, so that. Uh, that you'd have unique monsters for every setting, essentially. So it's very Call of Cthulhu in that respect. Uh, you've got generic monsters, but nobody uses them because everyone makes their own because they're much more specialised. Um, and similarly, you have uh, yeah, designing your own, oh no, designing your own journeys and designing your own scenarios. Um, somewhere. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Designing your own adventures. Uh, with hints on designing villains, which specifically say that insane villains are not very fun, which is always fun, uh, and always uh, a good tip for designing uh, villains, because uh, villains who are evil for the sake of being evil are generally not a great villain. Because there's no motivation. Uh, so you don't understand why they don't just give up when it sort of not ceases to be profitable to be evil anymore. Uh, and finally in this book there is a scenario. Um, it's shit. So if you were thinking of buying this, thinking, oh, there'll be a nice little adventure to replicate one of the adventures of Buck Rogers. Uh, don't, it's shit. Um, <laughs> it's called Ghost in the Machine. And it is a very, very, very linear um, adventure path. Uh, it does state in it that it's supposed to be an in introductory um, adventure. But even so, even by that metric, it's so linear. And there are several points where it says, give the players a decision, but be aware if they make the wrong decision, the adventure must stop. Um and then you must reset and encourage them to make the other decision. Which is just bad design. <laughs> Either go whole hog with your railroad and don't give them the choice. Or just, you know, give them the choice. Um, yeah, so I'm not a big fan of that. I think it's probably the weakest part of it. The setting description that are given for anywhere other than Earth and Mars are pretty generic. Um, so, yeah, overall, I prefer the uh, characters and combat book. But the final book, technology book, I've got even less to say about, to be honest. Art's quite nice. Um, and that logo again, just, just bask in the majesty of that logo. Um, yeah. So, I, look, you can see how thin it is. So it's barely worth going into. It's basically similar to those, like, equipment catalogs you get for... Uh, I presume you get them for D&D, &D, I don't actually know, but the ones I'm thinking of are the Street Samurai books for Shadowrun. And it's just that, with lots of different equipment, prices and stats for it, and... Yeah. As somebody who pretty much only GMs, uh, this stuff doesn't hold a huge amount of appeal for me because I like to invent my own equipment and put unique items into my settings. Uh, but if you're more of a player and you're more of that gun bunny character who likes to look through uh, the equipment manuals and buy all the best gear and stuff, then this is probably going to do good things for you. Uh, and to be fair, it does provide quite a lot of detail for any of the... Um, and for each of the weapons in particular, um, it goes through how the laser pistols and laser rifles work, that they've got a series of capacitors in them. I don't know enough about the science behind it to know if it would work. Uh, but as I say, these are now <coughs> 25 years old, based on a series from the 70s that was based on uh, something from the 20s. So, you know, I, I think we can forgive a few scientific uh, inaccuracies. Um, yeah, so the laser beams are all used with 
uh, capacitors and things like that. Uh, I do like that it specifically says, and I'm just going to read this bit out. Uh, capacitor lasers are tunable. A special filter can be inserted into the laser aperture, giving the beam a desired colour. This is particularly useful in firefights in the dark, as it helps identify friend from foe. Um, and I love that as a, well, as a little bit of detail. Uh, incredibly stupid as it would be <laughs> to actually have that as a functioning part of a weapon. Um, but as a scenario hook as well, that you've got people who will, uh, mercenaries and the like, who have different filters fitted to their guns and will go around trying to blend into different groups during firefights and things like that. Um, it's quite nice uh, and it's something that, as far as I'm aware, is unique to this setting. Um, I guess it's pretty much the same as the we've got different coloured lightsabers in Star Wars, but um, yeah, it's quite nice. So that's the three main game books for uh, the system covered. Now we'll just go through what else is in the box. Uh, there are a number of these big cards detailing characters and um, detailing characters and spaceships. And this one is obviously the Princess of Mars because they have no idea how to hide their influences. Um, as you may know, uh, and as I will be going into in my discussion video for uh, Buck Rogers, uh, the Princess of Mars was uh, Edgar Edgar Rice Burroughs' novel, uh, John Carter of Mars, um, the recent film and the entire series of books. Princess of Mars was the first one uh, and was one of the strongest influences for the original Buck Rogers series. Um, so, yeah, it's quite nice. Uh, on the back, they've got their sort of stats and a map of the ship uh, and so a little bit of fluff text. Um, yeah, so they're quite nice. We've got some other ones, uh, including some terrible, terrible puns from the far future. Um, this, what I'm pretty sure is a submarine. Uh, because I can't think of any spacecraft. <laughs> um, but it looks like a blimp more than anything else. Um, yeah, I'm not, not a huge fan of that design. I suppose, yeah, I assume. I haven't actually checked. Uh, oh, no, it's not even, uh, like if it was a capital class ship or something, or the Battler, I think, is their equivalent of a capital ship then I could kind of understand that design, but Freighter makes it sound like it should be going into the atmosphere. Uh, and that thing's not going to do very well there. So, yeah. But I don't really know what's going on there. Uh, and these two get honourable mentions because that, that's Killer Kane's rogue ship. And that's Black Barney's free enterprise. And these are quite clearly the same ship, but one is red and one is blue, and they're mirrored. They are obviously the same ship, more or less. Some slight surface details, but yeah, they're, they're very much the same ship. Uh, this seems to happen with a few of them, actually. Uh, and I don't really understand why they've done that, why they didn't just include single... Um, single cards that either had details about a class of ship that used various sim similar ones or just didn't include ones that were obvious duplicates or employed more artists. One of the two. I don't know. Uh, and then we've got some character cards here. Obviously you couldn't do it without the titular Buck, Buck Rogers himself. Uh, looking at all very Aryan and handsome there. Uh, yep. Um, I don't know whether it's intended to be a likeness to Gil... Oh, damn, I've forgotten his second name. But the guy who played it in the, uh, series. Uh, in the second series, not in the 1930s series. Um, but it's, it's not a fantastic likeness, if it is supposed to be him. Apart from the fact that he's blonde. 
and has a lazy eye, apparently. Um, Killer Kane, or Boise from Only Fools and Horses, as you may otherwise know him. Uh, looking like a very traditional camp 80s villain, which is pleasing. This is quite obviously Fraser Crane. Um, Kelsey Grammer uh, being very fluorescent in that jacket. And this one is Kelsey Grammer in a beard and apparently on the verge of doing a striptease with his pipe and I don't really want to think about that anymore. Um, and the final thing that's included, uh, there are a few other cards, but they're all either duplicates or just not very interesting. So, you know, if you want to find out about those, I'm sure you can pick them up yourself. Uh, and I'm sure they are detailed online somewhere. Possibly, I can't find much record of this game online, so I don't think it did very well. Um, possibly because the trend was... Uh, sort of dying out. Buck Rogers wasn't as well known and wasn't as um, interesting, at least not to the the child age group that role playing games were pitched to at the time, um, as compared to earlier in the nineteen uh, eighties. So they may have missed their mark a little there. Uh, and this, which just about passes as a GM screen. Um, and I know it's all production values because it was there and it is at least laminated. You can see that's kind of a bit shiny. Yep. Um, only on one side though. The, this side isn't. Uh, it has tables on both sides, which is useful ish because it's good, but this side is just equipment lists. So I suppose if you're going to sit there with this facing your players with the equipment lists on them, that's going to function more as a distraction than anything else. So. I, I don't really see that as a valuable addition somehow. Um, but yeah, I guess it does the job. It's just not very pretty. Uh, I, pre I prefer to have art on the outside of my GM screen if I'm going to use them. To be honest, I've only recently started using them anyway uh, because I don't tend to do much in the way of secret roles. Um, so, yeah. But it's there and it's nice to have as a reference sheet anyway. So that's quite nice. Um, yeah, and that's about it. There's a few other sort of maps and things in here. There's these, which are a cross-section of various uh, spaceships and things, which would be nice if they weren't so generic. Like, I want to know how they're furnished, because this is obviously supposed to be like, a view through the tube of the spaceship, rather than um, from the side. So I want to know how they'd be furnished. Would they be furnished sort of on the outside around here, or would they be furnished in the middle, like, free-floating, or, you know, I want, I want to know how they'd be worked and how they'd have the computers and things set up. The exception to this is the power deck where they've got the engines and things like that actually modelled in. Uh, the weapon turrets kind of do as well. But yeah, so they're okay, but I don't think this really warranted a big poster size um, detail of them. Could have been done just as easily with a page in one of the books, uh, and I wouldn't have minded. On the other side, however... There's this really quite nice map of the whole solar system, giving distances and things like that. Um, if we have a look on the other end, yeah, it's got distances to all of the different planets and between them and uh, gravity weights and things like that. Uh, that one's quite nice. I do quite like that, even just on its own, without role-playing purpose. I just quite like it as a, as a map of the solar system, so well done for that, I guess. Um... And a map of a Terran, uh, not Terran, lunar uh, base. Lunar base. 
which is okay, I guess. At least it's got a key, so it's got all of the... Put that upside down, and I haven't. Um, so, like, it's got all of the different bits and pieces uh, labelled on it, which is nice. It Obviously, I guess, again, it's a production values thing, and the fact that it's 25 years old. But it looks like something I knocked together in Campaign Cartographer when I was 13. So, I'm not particularly impressed with it. Um, I also don't really see a need for it. Um, but again, I think that's more the way I game compared to the way these were marketed. And a giant hex grid for doing space battles on, which I do approve of, because that's quite nice. Uh, and it has stars in the background and everything. So And it's huge. This is a two, I think. Uh, A2 poster, so you've got plenty of room for manoeuvring around. Um, so, yeah, again, I, I do actually approve of that one. So, yeah. And that's about it. So, that's the Buck Rogers role-playing game. Uh, as I say, I think the production values are pretty high, um, especially for the time period when it was done. There are a few bits and pieces that don't really stand up, but overall, I think the production has that nice Z-Rust kind of, it was all very looking forward and far future uh, when it was put together, but it feels a bit dated now, but in a nice way. So I'm quite, yeah, I, I quite like that. Um, and I'm quite glad I own it. I picked it up for about £10, I think, um, in a second-hand store. So they may be floating around on eBay. I haven't actually checked the prices. Um, if I can be bothered, I might put a... Uh, splash at the end with um prices and things if you want to try and find it on ebay um but yeah i like it more as a collector's piece i don't know that i'll be playing it anytime soon um although having recently been watching the buck rogers tv series uh and quite enjoying it much to my own disdain i think <laughs> um i might at some point if i can find other people who are also equally interested in it um yeah, so that is Buck Rogers in the 25th century. Um, yeah, buy it and look at it. Probably don't play it if you're familiar with any later role-playing games. Um, I guess you could adapt it as a setting for Traveller or Stars Without Number or something like that. Stars Without Number is probably a bit brutal. But Traveller maybe, or any of the space opera sort of uh settings or, or systems rather uh even star wars you could probably do it as star wars is obviously infamously indebted to buck rogers and flash gordon then you could uh use that to run it probably and it would work just as well just just for the love of god don't use the original system it's it's so dated and clunky um even other d20 systems have moved on now um the OSR probably has uh, some stuff that could be used to update it. Uh, the people who still play old uh, second ed AD&D and things like that. A lot of their hacks and stuff would probably be convertible over to this. Um, but yeah, I think if you like the setting, or to be honest, even if you don't know a huge amount about it, because I bought, uh, I bought this ages ago because I liked the art um, before I'd ever got into the actual original series or anything like that um then it makes for quite a nice sort of space opera uh thing it's not going to do anything crunchy or particularly realistic so it's certainly not a substitute for uh things like traveler or anything like that um but it's a nice light fun setting uh bit silly bit cheesy and camp in that 80s way but that's a positive for a lot of people so i think there's definitely a, a good reason to pick it up if you see it and it's going i don't know maybe less than 20 quid if for a nice box set with a few things in it um i'd probably pay up to that for it um so yeah that's that's my review of buck rogers in the 25th century goodbye <laughs>